The Great Controversy, Chapter 5, John Wycliffe. Before the Reformation, there were at times but very few copies of the Bible in existence. But God had not suffered his word to be wholly destroyed. Its truths were not to be forever hidden. He could as easily unchain the words of life as he could open prison doors and unbolt iron gates to set his servants free. In the different countries of Europe, men were moved by the Spirit of God to search for the truth as for hid treasures. Providentially guided to the Holy Scriptures, they studied the sacred pages with intense interest. They were willing to accept the light at any cost to themselves. Though they did not see all things clearly, they were enabled to perceive many long-buried truths. As heaven sent messengers, they went forth, rending asunder the chains of error and superstition, and calling upon those who had been so long enslaved to arise and assert their liberty. Except among the Waldensians, the word of God had for ages been locked up in languages known only to the learned. But the time had come for the scriptures to be translated and given to the people of different lands in their native tongue. The world had passed its midnight. The hours of darkness were wearing away, and in many lands appeared tokens of the coming dawn. In the 14th century arose in England the morning star of the Reformation. John Wycliffe was the herald of reform, not for England alone, but for all Christendom. The great protest against Rome, which it was permitted him to utter, was never to be silenced. That protest opened the struggle which was to result in the emancipation of individuals, of churches, and of nations. Wycliffe received a liberal education and with him the fear of the Lord was the beginning of wisdom. He was noted at college for his fervent piety as well as for his remarkable talents and sound scholarship. In his thirst for knowledge, he sought to become acquainted with every branch of learning. He was educated in the scholastic philosophy, in the canons of the church, and in the civil law, especially that of his own country. In his after labors, the value of this early training was apparent. A thorough acquaintance with the speculative philosophy of his time enabled him to expose its errors. And by his study of national and ecclesiastical law, he was prepared to engage in the great struggle for civil and religious liberty. While he could wield the weapons drawn from the Word of God, he had acquired the intellectual discipline of the schools and he understood the tactics of the schoolmen. The power of his genius and the extent and thoroughness of his knowledge commanded the respect of both friends and foes. His adherents saw with satisfaction that their champion stood foremost among the leading minds of the nation and his enemies were prevented from casting contempt upon the cause of reform by exposing the ignorance or weakness of its supporter. While Wycliffe was still at college, he entered upon the study of the scriptures. In those early times, when the Bible existed only in the ancient languages, scholars were enabled to find their way to the fountain of truth which was closed to the uneducated classes. Thus already, the way had been prepared for Wycliffe's future work as a reformer. Men of learning had studied the Word of God and had found the great truth of His free grace there revealed. In their teachings, they had spread a knowledge of this truth and had led others to turn to the living oracles. When Wycliffe's attention was directed to the Scriptures, he entered upon their investigation with the same thoroughness which had enabled him to master the learning of the schools. Heretofore, he had felt a great want which neither his scholastic studies nor the teaching of the church could satisfy. In the word of God, 
He found that which he had before sought in vain. Here he saw the plan of salvation revealed and Christ set forth as the only advocate for man. He gave himself to the service of Christ and determined to proclaim the truths he had discovered. Like after reformers, Wycliffe did not, at the opening of his work, foresee whether it would lead him. He did not set himself deliberately in opposition to Rome, but devotion to truth could not but bring him in conflict with falsehood. The more clearly he discerned the errors of the papacy, the more earnestly he presented the teaching of the Bible. He saw that Rome had forsaken the word of God for human tradition. He fearlessly accused the priesthood of having banished the scriptures and demanded that the Bible be restored to the people and that its authority be again established in the church. He was an able and earnest teacher and his daily life was a demonstration of the truths he preached. His knowledge of the scriptures, the force of his reasoning, the purity of his life and his unbending courage and integrity won for him general esteem and confidence. Many of the people had become dissatisfied with their former faith as they saw the iniquity that prevailed in the Roman church and they hailed with unconcealed joy the truths brought to view by Wycliffe. But the papal leaders were filled with rage when they perceived that this reformer was gaining an influence greater than their own. Wycliffe was a keen detector of error, and he struck fearlessly against many of the abuses sanctioned by the authority of Rome. While acting as a chaplain for the king, he took a bold stand against the payment of tribute claimed by the Pope from the English monarch and showed that the papal assumption of authority over secular rulers was contrary to both reason and revelation. The demands of the Pope had excited great indignation and Wycliffe's teachings exerted an influence upon the leading minds of the nation. The king and the nobles united in denying the pontiff's claim to temporal authority and in refusing the payment of the tribute. Thus an effectual blow was struck against the papal supremacy in England. Another evil against which the reformer waged long and resolute battle was the institution of the orders of the mendicant friars. These friars swarmed in England, casting a blight upon the greatness and prosperity of the nation. Industry, education, morals, all felt the withering influence. The monk's life of idleness and beggary was not only a heavy drain upon the resources of the people, but it brought useful labor into contempt. The youth were demoralized and corrupted. By the influence of the friars, many were induced to enter a cloister and devote themselves to a monastic life. And this not only without the consent of their parents, but even without their knowledge and contrary to their commands. One of the early fathers of the Roman Church, urging the claims of monasticism above the obligations of filial love and duty had declared, though thy father should lie before thy door, weeping and lamenting, and thy mother should show the body that bore thee and the breasts that nursed thee. See that thou trample them underfoot and go onward straightway to Christ. By this monstrous inhumanity, as Luther afterwards styled it, savoring more of the wolf and the tyrant than of the Christian and the man, were the hearts of the children steeled against their parents. Thus did the papal leaders, like the Pharisees of old, make the commandment of God of none effect by their tradition. 
Thus, homes were made desolate, and parents were deprived of the society of their sons and daughters. Even the students in the universities were deceived by the false representations of the monks and induced to join their orders. Many afterward repented this step, seeing that they had blighted their own lives and had brought sorrow upon their parents. But once fast in the snare, it was impossible for them to obtain their freedom. Many parents, fearing the influence of the monks, refused to send their sons to the universities, and there was a marked falling off in the number of students in attendance at the great centers of learning. The schools languished, and ignorance prevailed. The Pope had bestowed on these monks the power to hear confessions and to grant pardon. And this became a source of great evil. Bent on enhancing their gains, the friars were so ready to grant absolution that criminals of all descriptions resorted to them, and as a result, the worst vices rapidly increased. The sick and the poor were left to suffer, while the gifts that should have relieved their wants went to the monks, who with threats demanded the alms of the people, denouncing the impiety of those who should withhold gifts from their orders. Notwithstanding their profession of poverty, the wealth of the friars was constantly increasing in their magnificent edifices and luxurious tables made more apparent the growing poverty of the nation. And while spending their time in luxury and pleasure, they sent out in their stead ignorant men who could only recount marvelous tales, legends, and jests to amuse the people and make them still more completely the dupes of the monks. Yet, the friars continued to maintain their hold on the superstitious multitudes and led them to believe that all religious duty was comprised in acknowledging the supremacy of the Pope, adoring the saints and making gifts to the monks and that this was sufficient to secure them a place in heaven. Men of learning and piety had labored in vain to bring about a reform in these monastic orders. But Wycliffe, with clearer insight, struck at the root of the evil, declaring that the system itself was false and that it should be abolished. Discussion and inquiry were awakening. As the monks traversed the country, vending the Pope's pardons, many were led to doubt the possibility of purchasing forgiveness with money. And they questioned whether they should not seek pardon from God rather than from the Pontiff of Rome. Not a few were alarmed at the rapacity of the friars whose greed seemed never to be satisfied. The monks and priests of Rome, said they, are eating us away like a cancer. God must deliver us or the people will perish. To cover their avarice, these begging monks claimed that they were following the Savior's example, declaring that Jesus and his disciples had been supported by the charities of the people. This claim resulted in injury to their cause, for it led many to the Bible to learn the truth for themselves, a result which, of all others, was least desired by Rome. The minds of men were directed to the source of truth, which it was her object to conceal. Wycliffe began to write and publish tracts against the friars, not, however, seeking so much to enter into dispute with them as to call the minds of the people to the teachings of the Bible and its author. He declared that the power of pardon or of excommunication 
is possessed by the Pope in no greater degree than by common priests, and that no man can be truly excommunicated unless he has first brought upon himself the condemnation of God. In no more effectual way could he have undertaken the overthrow of that mammoth fabric of spiritual and temporal dominion which the Pope had erected and in which the souls and bodies of millions were held captive. Again, Wycliffe was called to defend the rights of the English crown against the encroachments of Rome, and being appointed a royal ambassador, he spent two years in the Netherlands in conference with the commissioners of the Pope. Here he was brought into communication with Ecclesiastes from France, Italy, and Spain. And he had an opportunity to look behind the scenes and gain a knowledge of many things which would have remained hidden from him in England. He learned much that was to give point to his after labors. In these representatives from the papal court, he read the true character and aims of the hierarchy. He returned to England to repeat his former teachings more openly and with greater zeal, declaring that covetousness, pride, and deception were the gods of Rome. In one of his tracts, he said, speaking of the Pope and his collectors, they draw out of our land poor man's livelihood and many thousand marks by the year of the king's money for sacraments and spiritual things that is cursed heresy of simony and maketh all Christendom assent and maintain this heresy and certs though our realm had a huge hill of gold and never other man took therein but only this proud worldly priest collector by process of time this hill must be spended for he taketh ever money out of our land and sendeth not again but God's curse for his seminary. Soon after his return to England, Wycliffe received from the king the appointment to the rectory of Lutterworth. This was an assurance that the monarch, at least, had not been displeased by his plain speaking. Wycliffe's influence was felt in shaping the action of the court, as well as in molding the belief of the nation. The papal thunders were soon hurled against him. Three bulls were dispatched to England, to the university, to the king, and to the prelates, all commanding immediate and decisive measures to silence the teacher of heresy. Before the arrival of the bulls, however, the bishops, in their zeal, had summoned Wycliffe before them for trial. But two of the most powerful princes in the kingdom accompanied him to the tribunal, and the people, surrounding the building and rushing in, so intimidated the judges that the proceedings were for the time suspended, and he was allowed to go his way in peace. A little later, Edward III, whom in his old age the prelates were seeking to influence against the reformer, died and Wycliffe's former protector became regent of the kingdom. But the arrival of the papal bulls laid upon all England a peremptory command for the arrest and imprisonment of the heretic. These measures pointed directly to the stake. It appeared certain that Wycliffe must soon fall a prey to the vengeance of Rome. But he, who declared to one of old, Fear not, I am thy shield, again stretched out his hand to protect his servant. Death came, not to the reformer, but to the pontiff who had decreed his destruction. Gregory XI died, and the ecclesiastics who had assembled for Wycliffe's trial dispersed. God's providence still further overruled events to give opportunity for the growth of the Reformation. The death of Gregory was followed by the election of two rival popes, 
two conflicting powers, each professedly infallible, now claimed obedience. Each called upon the faithful to assist him in making war upon the other, enforcing his demands by terrible anathemas against his adversaries and promises of reward in heaven to his supporters. The occurrence greatly weakened the power of the papacy. The rival fractions had all they could do to attack each other, and Wycliffe, for a time, had rest. Anathemas and recriminations were flying from pope to pope, and torrents of blood were poured out to support their conflicting claims. Crimes and scandals flooded the church. Meanwhile, the reformer, in the quiet retirement of his parish of Lutterworth, was laboring diligently to point men from the contending popes to Jesus, the Prince of Peace. The schism, with all the strife and corruption which it caused, prepared the way for the Reformation by enabling the people to see what the papacy really was. In a tract which he published on the schism of the popes, Wycliffe called upon the people to consider whether these two priests were not speaking the truth in condemning each other as the Antichrist. God, said he, would no longer suffer the fiend to reign in only one such priest, but made division among two, so that men in Christ's name may the more easily overcome them both. Wycliffe, like his master, preached the gospel to the poor. Not content with spreading the light in their humble homes in his own parish at Lutterworth, he determined that it should be carried to every part of England. To accomplish this, he organized a body of preachers, simple, devout men, who loved the truth and desired nothing so much as to extend it. These men went everywhere, teaching in the marketplaces, in the streets of the great cities, and in the country lanes. They sought out the aged, the sick, and the poor, and opened to them the glad tidings of the grace of God. As a professor of theology at Oxford, Wycliffe preached the word of God in the halls of the university. So faithfully did he present the truth to the students under his instruction that he received the title of the Gospel Doctor. But the greatest work of his life was to be the translation of the scriptures into the English language. In a work on the truth and meaning of scripture, he expressed his intention to translate the Bible so that every man in England might read in the language in which he was born the wonderful works of God. But suddenly his labors were stopped, though not yet sixty years of age, unceasing toil, study, and the assaults of his enemies had told upon his strength and made him prematurely old. He was attacked by a dangerous illness. The tidings brought great joy to the friars. Now they thought he would bitterly repent the evil he had done the church, and they hurried to his chamber to listen to his confession. Representatives from the four religious orders with four civil officers gathered about the supposed dying man. You have death on your lips, they said. Be touched by your faults and retract in our presence all that you have said to our injury. The reformer listened in silence. Then he bade his attendant raise him up in his bed, and gazing steadily upon them as they stood waiting for his recantation, he said in the firm, strong voice which had so often caused them to tremble, I shall not die, but live, and again declare the evil deeds of the friars. Astonished and abashed, 
the monks hurried from the room. Wycliffe's words were fulfilled. He lived to place in the hands of his countrymen the most powerful of all weapons against Rome to give them the Bible, the heaven-appointed agent to liberate, enlighten, and evangelize the people. There were many and great obstacles to surmount in the accomplishment of this work. Wycliffe was weighed down with infirmities. He knew that only a few years for labor remained for him. He saw the opposition which he must meet, but encouraged by the promises of God's word, he went forward, nothing daunted. In the full vigor of his intellectual powers, rich in experience, he had been preserved and prepared by God's special providence for this, the greatest of his labors. While all Christendom was filled with tumult, the reformer in his rectory at Lutterworth, unheeding the storm that raged without, applied himself to his chosen task. At last, the work was completed. The first English translation of the Bible ever made. The word of God was opened to England. The reformer feared not now the prism or the stake. He had placed in the hands of the English people a light which should never be extinguished. In giving the Bible to his countrymen, he had done more to break the fetters of ignorance and vice, more to liberate and elevate his country than was ever achieved by the most brilliant victories on fields of battle. The art of printing being still unknown, it was only by a slow and wearisome labor that copies of the Bible could be multiplied. So great was the interest to obtain the book that many willingly engaged in the work of transcribing it. But it was with difficulty that the copyists could supply the demand. Some of the more wealthy purchasers desired the whole Bible. Others bought only a portion. In many cases, several families united to purchase a copy. Thus, Wycliffe's Bible soon found its way to the homes of the people. The appeal to men's reason aroused them from their passive submission to papal dogmas. Wycliffe now taught the distinctive doctrines of Protestantism, salvation through faith in Christ, and the sole infallibility of the scriptures. The preachers whom he had sent out circulated the Bible, together with the reformers' writings, and with such success that the new faith was accepted by nearly one half of the people of England. The appearance of the scriptures brought dismay to the authorities of the church. They had now to meet an agency more powerful than Wycliffe, an agency against which their weapons would avail little. There was at this time no law in England prohibiting the Bible, for it had never been published in the language of the people. Such laws were afterward enacted and rigorously enforced. Meanwhile, notwithstanding the efforts of the priests, there was for a season opportunity for the circulation of the Word of God. Again the papal leaders plotted to silence the reformer's voice. Before three tribunals, he was successfully summoned for trial, but without avail. First, a synod of bishops declared his writings heretical, and winning the young king, Richard II, to their side, they obtained a royal decree consigning to prison all who should hold the condemned doctrines. Wycliffe appealed from the Synod to Parliament. He fearlessly arranged the hierarchy before the National Council and demanded a reform of the enormous abuses sanctioned by the Church. With convincing power, he portrayed the usurpation and corruptions of the Papal See. His enemies were brought to confusion. The friends and supporters of Wycliffe had been forced to yield 
and it had been confidently expected that the reformer himself, in his old age, alone and friendless, would bow to the combined authority of the crown and the mitre. But instead of this, the papers saw themselves defeated. Parliament, roused by the stirring appeals of Wycliffe, repealed the persecuting edict and the reformer was again at liberty. A third time he was brought to trial and now before the highest ecclesiastical tribunal in the kingdom. Here no favour would be shown to heresy. Here at last Rome would triumph and the reformer's work would be stopped. So thought the papists. If they could but accomplish their purpose, Wycliffe would be forced to abjure his doctrines or would leave the court only for the flames. But Wycliffe did not retract. He would not dissemble. He fearlessly maintained his teachings and repelled the accusations of his persecutors. Losing sight of himself, of his position, of the occasion, he summoned his hearers before the divine tribunal and weighed their sophistries and deceptions in the balances of eternal truth. The power of the Holy Spirit was felt in the council room. A spell from God was upon the hearers. They seemed to have no power to leave the place. As arrows from the Lord's quiver, the reformers' words pierced their hearts. The charge of heresy, which they had brought against him, he, with convincing power, threw back upon themselves. Why, he demanded, did they dare to spread their errors for the sake of gain, to make merchandise of the grace of God? With whom, think you, he finally said, are ye contending? With an old man on the brink of the grave? No, with truth. Truth which is stronger than you and will overcome you. So saying, he withdrew from the assembly and not one of his adversaries attempted to prevent him. Wycliffe's work was almost done. The banner of truth which he had so long borne was soon to fall from his hand. But once more, he was to bear witness for the gospel. The truth was to be proclaimed from the very stronghold of the kingdom of error. Wycliffe was summoned for trial before the papal tribunal at Rome, which had so often shed the blood of the saints. He was not blind to the danger that threatened him, yet he would have obeyed the summons had not a shock of palsy made it impossible for him to perform the journey. But though his voice was not to be heard at Rome, he could speak by letter, and this he determined to do. From his rectory, the reformer wrote to the Pope a letter which, while respectful in tone and Christian in spirit, was a keen rebuke to the pomp and pride of the papal see. Verily, I do rejoice, he said, to open and declare unto every man the faith which I do hold, and especially unto the Bishop of Rome, which, forasmuch as I do suppose to be sound and true, he will most willingly confirm my said faith, or, if it be erroneous, amend the same. First, I suppose, that the gospel of Christ is the whole body of God's law. I do give and hold the Bishop of Rome, for as much as he is the Vicar of Christ here on earth, to be most bound of all other men unto the law of the gospel. For the greatness among Christ's disciples did not consist in worldly dignity or honors, but in the near and exact following of Christ in his life and manners. Christ, for the time of his pilgrimage here, was a most poor man, objecting and casting off all worldly rule and honor. 
no faithful man ought to follow either the Pope himself or any of the holy men, but in such points as he hath followed the Lord Jesus Christ. For Peter and the sons of Zebedee, by desiring worldly honor, contrary to the following of Christ's steps, did offend, and therefore in those errors they are not to be followed. The Pope ought to leave unto the secular power all temporal dominion and rule, and thereunto effectually to move and exhort his whole clergy. For so did Christ, and especially by his apostles. Wherefore, if I have erred in any of these points, I will most humbly submit myself unto correction, even by death, if necessity so require. And if I could labor according to my will, or desire in my own person, I would surely present myself before the Bishop of Rome. But the Lord hath otherwise visited me to the contrary, and hath taught me rather to obey God than man. In closing, he said, Let us pray unto our God that he will so stir up our Pope Urban VI as he began, that he, with his clergy, may follow the Lord Jesus Christ in life and manners, and that they may teach the people effectually, and that they, likewise, may faithfully follow them in the same. Thus Wycliffe presented to the Pope and his cardinals the meekness and humility of Christ, exhibiting not only to themselves but to all Christendom the contrast between them and the Master whose representatives they professed to be. Wycliffe fully expected that his life would be the price of his fidelity. The King, the Pope, and the bishops were united to accomplish his ruin, and it seemed certain that a few months at most would bring him to the stake. But his courage was unshaken. Why do you talk of seeking the crown of martyrdom afar? He said. Preach the gospel of Christ to haughty prelates, and martyrdom will not fail you. What? I should live and be silent? Never! Let the blow fall. I await its coming. But God's providence still shielded his servant, the man who for a whole lifetime had stood boldly in defense of the truth, in daily peril of his life, was not to fall a victim of the hatred of its foes. Wycliffe had never sought to shield himself, but the Lord had been his protector. And now, when his enemies felt sure of their prey, God's hand removed him beyond their reach. In his church at Lutterworth, as he was about to dispense the communion, he fell, stricken with palsy, and in a short time yielded up his life. God had appointed to Wycliffe his work. He had put the word of truth in his mouth, and he set a guard about him that this word might come to the people. His life was protected and his labors were prolonged until a foundation was laid for the great work of the Reformation. Wycliffe came from the obscurity of the Dark Ages. There were none who went before him from whose work he could shape his system of reform. Raised like John the Baptist to accomplish a special mission, he was the herald of a new era. Yet in the system of truth which he presented, there was a unity and completeness which reformers who followed him did not exceed and which some of them did not reach, even a hundred years later. So broad and deep was laid the foundation, so firm and true was the framework, that it needed not to be reconstructed by those who came after him. The great movement that Wycliffe inaugurated, which was to liberate the conscience and the intellect, 
and set free the nations so long bound to the triumphal car of Rome had its spring in the Bible. Here was the source of that stream of blessing which, like the water of life, has flowed down the ages since the 14th century. Wycliffe accepted the Holy Scriptures with implicit faith as the inspired revelation of God's will, a sufficient rule of faith and practice. He had been educated to regard the Church of Rome as the divine, infallible authority and to accept with unquestioning reverence the established teachings and customs of a thousand years. But he turned away from all these to listen to God's holy word. This was the authority which he urged the people to acknowledge. Instead of the church speaking through the Pope, he declared the only true authority to be the voice of God speaking through his word. And he taught not only that the Bible is a perfect revelation of God's will, but that the Holy Spirit is its only interpreter, and that every man is, by the study of its teachings, to learn his duty for himself. Thus he turned the minds of men from the Pope and the Church of Rome to the Word of God. Wycliffe was one of the greatest of the reformers. In breadth of intellect, in clearness of thought, in firmness to maintain the truth, and in boldness to defend it, he was equaled by few who came after him. Purity of life, unwearying diligence in study and in labor, incorruptible integrity, and Christ-like love and faithfulness in his ministry characterized the first of the reformers. And this, notwithstanding the intellectual darkness and moral corruption of the age from which he emerged. The character of Wycliffe is a testimony to the educating, transforming power of the Holy Scriptures. It was the Bible that made him what he was. The effort to grasp the great truths of revelation imparts freshness and vigor to all the faculties. It expands the mind, sharpens the perceptions, and ripens the judgment. The study of the Bible will ennoble every thought, feeling, and aspiration as no other study can. It gives stability of purpose, patience, courage, and fortitude. It refines the character and sanctifies the soul. An earnest, reverent study of the scriptures, bringing the mind of the student in direct contact with the infinite mind, would give to the world men of stronger and more active intellect, as well as of nobler principle than has ever resulted from the ablest training that human philosophy affords. The entrance of thy words, says the psalmist, giveth light, it giveth understanding. The doctrines which had been taught by Wycliffe continued for a time to spread. His followers, known as Wycliffeites and Lollards, not only traversed England, but scattered to other lands, carrying the knowledge of the gospel. Now that their leader was removed, the preachers labored with even greater zeal than before, and multitudes flocked to listen to their teachings. Some of the nobility, and even the wife of the king, were among the converts. In many places there was a marked reform in the manners of the people, and the idolatrous symbols of Romanism were removed from the churches. But soon the pitiless storm of persecution burst upon those who had dared to accept the Bible as their guide. The English monarchs, eager to strengthen their power by securing the support of Rome, did not hesitate to sacrifice the reformers. For the first time in the history of England, the stake was decreed against the disciples of the gospel. 
Martyrdom succeeded martyrdom. The advocates of truth, prescribed and tortured, could only pour their cries into the ear of the Lord of Sabaoth. Hunted as foes of the church and traitors to the realm, they continued to preach in secret places, finding shelter as best they could in the humble homes of the poor and often hiding away even in dens and caves. Notwithstanding the rage of persecution, a calm, devout, earnest, patient protest against the prevailing corruption of religious faith continued for centuries to be uttered. The Christians of that early time had only a partial knowledge of the truth, but they had learned to love and obey God's word, and they patiently suffered for its sake. Like the disciples in apostolic days, Many sacrificed their worldly possessions for the cause of Christ. Those who were permitted to dwell in their homes gladly sheltered their banished brethren. And when they too were driven forth, they cheerfully accepted the lot of the outcast. Thousands, it is true, terrified by the fury of their persecutors, purchased their freedom at the sacrifice of their faith and went out of their prisons clothed in penitent's robes to publish their recantation. But the number was not small, and among them were men of noble birth, as well as the humble and lowly, who bore fearless testimony to the truth in dungeon cells, in lowland towers, and in the midst of torture and flames, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to know the fellowship of his sufferings. The papers had failed to work their will with Wycliffe during his life, and their hatred could not be satisfied while his body rested quietly in the grave. By the decree of the Council of Constance, more than 40 years after his death, his bones were exhumed and publicly burned, and the ashes were thrown into a neighbouring brook. This brook, says an old writer, hath conveyed his ashes into Avon, Avon into Servan, Servan into the narrow seas, they into the main ocean. And thus the ashes of Wycliffe are the emblem of his doctrine, which now is dispersed all the world over. Little did his enemies realize the significance of their malicious act. It was through the writings of Wycliffe that John Huss of Bohemia was led to renounce many of the errors of Romanism and to enter upon the work of reform. Thus, in these two countries so widely separated, the seed of truth was sown. From Bohemia, the work extended to other lands. The minds of men were directed to the long forgotten word of God. A divine hand was preparing the way for the Great Reformation.